Right, so I'm going to give a talk about different high availability solutions for MySQL. Uh, normally this talk lasts like an hour and a half, which I don't have right now, so I'm going to do this uh, very briefly. And partly because Giuseppe, Giuseppe already talked about stuff and he will talk about more stuff afterwards, so I'm just going to do a kind of a quick overview. I'm trying to get this done in half an hour. Uh, but if you have any questions, do stop them. Okay. So I'm going to skip kind of the intro, um, what a high availability is and what you try to achieve with it. Um, I guess the cool thing, with, I mean, one thing is that it's very relative high availability, right? What's high depends on your, your needs. For some people, it might be high availability if the server is up most of the time, say like, during business hour, then it's enough. For some people, it needs to be up. Well, you need to have less than, than five minutes of downtime per year. But in any case, normally what you calculate is, uh, what you estimate is how many nines you have, which is kind of how, uh, how many nines you have in your uptime percentage. And this is mostly, of course, marketing stuff. So you would see products being marketed as five nines availability. And in most cases, there's nothing behind it. There's no scientific testing behind it saying that, okay, if you run this product for 100 years, it will be up or something. It's just a, a choice done by marketing and product management in most cases. So, I mean, really the same for MySQL AB, right? So, just be aware. It actually means something, but there is no scientific proof behind this stuff. Right, a um, few terms with regards to HA, uh, we don't have to go into this right now. I guess one important thing is, is that whenever you do a, a high availability solution, uh, you have to design your system so that, so that, I mean the main point is to design a, system, design a system that handles failure, right? So. If one part fails, you still have some kind of availability, some part of the system is off. And uh, if you do it in a distributed fashion, so you go towards the shared nothing architecture, so that you have in the independent boxes, uh, the kind of price you pay with that is that uh, uh, because you don't have any central piece of software, there is no uh, kind of manager of the cluster. Which also means you have to find, find out a way to deal with, with both failures and, and communication failures. Because in most cases, it's difficult to know the difference between a, an actual a hardware failure, and, I mean, a box falling, and just a communication breakdown between our nodes. Right? Let's say you have two nodes, one node fail. Of course, what should happen is that all your traffic talks to the node, uh, nodes alive. And that's all good. But what if you have two nodes? and they stop communicating. Node A will think that node B is down, and node B will think that node A is down. So what's kind of the solution? And it's actually, that's called a split brain. That's what you want to avoid at all costs, right? You don't want to have two nodes think that they are clustered, then one application writes to one, one to the other, and it's like game over. Your data is no longer sync, and you have to start from scratch. So whenever you have an HA solution, it has to be designed to handle this somehow intelligently. And there are different ways of doing that. Uh, you see, it, like node fencing, scumming, quarter, and so forth. Uh, yeah. Does anyone know what stunning means? It's. It means actually it's an acronym that stands for shoot the other node in the head. And it's actually a very good. Uh, it's actually an uh, accepted standard acronym. But it's a way of, of dealing with this problem. So if you have if you have two nodes, as I was saying, okay, we think node A thinks node B is down. We know, but we're not sure, right? So what do we do? Well, we make sure we just kill node B. So then we know. If we don't know, we don't know what we don't know, but we know what we know, right? So if we don't know if node B node B is alive or dead, we make sure he's dead. That way we can we can continue. We have a, a, a way of continuing with, with everyone to node A. Make sure that node B, if he was alive, he's no longer alive. So it's a way of dealing with. 
And Korg is another one where uh, you need to have a majority to be able to continue. So, of course, Korg doesn't work. If you have two nodes, you have 50 50 always, so you, don't, you can't use Korg for two node scenarios. You need three nodes at least. So, so, if you have a three node scenario and you have some kind of split or failure, you need to have two nodes alive that can communicate for the system to continue. And the one node will commit suicide, but it's got, because it's got less than. So, basically we're going to look at a few different HS solutions that you can use with MySQL. So, uh, the first one is the standard replication. Giuseppe just talked about for a while, well, he's talked about 5.6, but most of you should know how this works, right? Who has used MySQL replication? Besides Giuseppe. You haven't? You guys haven't? You never used it? But, but, who hasn't? Who hasn't? Have you used it? You have this? Yeah. You guys have? Okay. So, so, I mean, MySQL replication is, 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 is easy to use. It's there out of the box, right? You, all you have to do is turn on uh, your slaves. Your master doesn't have to do anything. Uh, it's asynchronous. It's slave driven. So, the master just sits there. The slave pulls data from the master. The slave keeps track of where he is. And you can have multiple slaves in the master. You can have uh, complex hierarchies, you can have a uh, slave, can be a master to another slave, so you can have a pretty complex hierarchy and stuff like that. Uh, so it's great. Uh, there's a few kind of issues with it. One is the fact that it's a single thread on the slave, so a slave has one thread. And you said I was talking about the 5 6 that kind of fix that but it doesn't work well with other features. Uh, there's no conflict resolution, so uh, you can set the master replication up to have multiple masters. You can have uh, a master, can have a slave, and then at the same time it's the slave to the other master. So in essence, it's like having multiple master, but what you do is you have two replication threads, which are independent. So it's not having multiple master. You have a master slave, master slave in both directions, and there's no no automation, no nothing at all to deal with conflicts and other things. So for example, if you update row, a, row 1 on node A, at the same time as you're updating the same row on the other machine, because you have two independent threads, the changes might shift at exactly the same time. And no one is there to detect anything, and you might end up with machines where the rows don't match. But, but everything was done the way it's supposed to, because there is no conflict detection. So, that's something to be aware of. Same goes if you have circular replication, you can create a circle of MySQL servers that replicate each other, but you have the same potential issues. You might have uh, conflicts and they're not detected. You have to kind of make sure that there are no conflicts in the application module. Right. And it's completely non synchronous, so it's actually three steps. When you create a transaction, uh, it's written to the bin log of the master. The second step is to ship the transaction to the slave, and the third step is that the third step is actually uh, write that transaction on the slave. So it's like a three-step process for a transaction going from your client to the slave. And if something fails, the transaction might or might not be on your slave, right? So if if a master crashes. Uh, if step two hasn't been reached, it means that your transaction only exists in the binary log of your crash slave. So if you can still read the binary log, you might be able to get the transaction. If your disks went, the transaction is gone forever. So there's no guarantee that your transaction will actually reach for load balancing, it wasn't designed for HA at all. Uh, back in the day when, when replication was introduced in MySQL, it was for a web company. It was actually a feature request from a web company who had mostly, mostly reads. So they had like 90% reads, 10% writes. So what you can do with replication is that you scale your reads because you only have to read from one machine. Every server has to write every transaction, so you don't scale your writes at all, but you scale your reads because you only have to read from one machine. 
So that was the that was the original design, and that's why it's used for steel quite a bit. But it's also used for HA, uh, kind of having standby master. You have a master, you have a slave. Something goes wrong, goes wrong with the master, you start using the slave, and it's there, it's running. It's uh, it's an active active solution, so you slave within seconds you can switch over. And also, if you have a standby server, you can, of course, use it for maintenance. You have your two machines, you want to do maintenance on your master, well, you switch everything over to your slave, then you do your maintenance on the master, so then you can stop it, do whatever, and let it resync. So, for doing maintenance, this is a very useful solution, having a standby, having a standby uh, And then, um, for geographical application, basically, even when you use some kind of synchronous, synchronous HA solution, you often don't want to use synchronous over longer distances, geographical distances, because it takes too long to send your transaction from one side of the planet to the other, right? So if you, for every transaction, you need to, need to wait for an acknowledgement from your slave in Australia, your transaction is on a latency of it will kill your transaction with your traffic, it will take too long. So you don't want to have a synchronous solution. So you can combine the application with some sort of local synchronous solutions for HA as well, for disaster recovery. So that's great. Uh, any questions about replication? Good. Uh, in MySQL 5.5, they added something called semi-sync replication as a plugin. Mm -hmm. It's still there. In MySQL, so uh, if you have MySQL 5.5, uh, service replication is not there built in, but if you install a plugin which is shipped with MySQL, so you have to do is install a plugin, then you have service replication. You don't actually have, actually have to install anything or download anything, it's there. Just, you just uh, load the plugin and then you can use this service replication uh, thing, which uh, basically what it does is that if uh, ensures that if you make a commit to transaction, we wait for one slave to get the transaction. So, if you remember earlier, we had the three steps here. One, two, three. With service replication, uh, when you commit your transaction, you actually wait for step two to happen on one slave before you get the acknowledge, send the acknowledgement to your client. So you ensure that if the master dies, the transaction is somewhere else. It's not written, it's not applied on the slave, but it exists in a different, somewhere on a different machine. So it kind of gives you increased security. But of course you pay a price. Uh, your transaction latency, I mean your transaction is uh, uh, found, the time will be a bit slower because you have to wait for a slave to get this. Uh, I haven't done any extensive testing actually, so I don't, have, I don't know how, how bad it is. Giuseppe, have you tested? Uh, semi at all? Yes. And do you have any numbers about how bad it is? I, I get some numbers that uh, look something like uh, between uh, 5 and 10% of performance. Uh, and I did that using uh, SysBench. Okay. However, somebody told me uh, on Facebook that uh, the the performance depends on the kind of load that you have. <coughs> so, really something that uh, you cannot uh, say in, uh, in absolute terms. Yeah, no. So if you have a lot of uh, small transactions, uh, you may have more, uh, more delay than uh, if you have uh, one few big ones. There is a tool called MHA, which, which uh, well, my company supports this, so we kind of have to talk about it. But it's actually a fairly good tool. It was, it was created by a, by a former MySQL consultant who worked for a Japanese company, and now works for Facebook. And it's a tool that helps you automate uh, the process uh, with MySQL replication. So the following MySQL replication uh, before 5.6 uh, is the fact that you have to keep track of binary logs, right? So the slave keeps track of its own position in the master's binary log. And this binary log position 
does not follow through the transaction. It only lives one step, master slave. So if you have a slave to the slave, uh, the original position is lost. So for example, if you have a replication chain, we have a master, a slave, and a slave, and the slave in between dies, there's no way of knowing, uh, of reconfiguring the, 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 the third slave to connect to the master, because the, the position translation is lost in between. It's, it's, it only exists in the, in the... I mean, basically, the position only exists one, one in one hierarchy. And it's the same when you have slaves on the same level. So, you have three slaves uh, connected to one master, uh, and now the master dies. You want to promote one of these slaves to become the new master, right? And the other slaves to connect to, and the other slaves to start start uh, uh, replicating from his new master. So again, you have the same problem. Uh, every slave knows where it is on the master's binary log. But now we're going to start replicating from a slave, so we need to know where we are in this slave's binary log. And there's no easy translation uh, between these positions. You can do it by looking at reader logs, looking at binary logs, comparing numbers, and so forth. You can get this information, but there's no easy way to do it. And basically, MHA does this. It looks into the log file, it basically translates binary log positions between different machines. So it does this for you. So with MHA, you can basically control uh, replication hierarchies. It only works uh, at the moment. Uh, well actually, it used to only work for one level of hierarchy. So you can have a master and lots of slaves, but not the second level. But it was actually fixed, and so now you can have three levels of, of hierarchies, and it actually works. So it does the translation for you. So, so what does MHA do? It basically uh, it's, it's a bunch of Perl scripts that you install on your, on your slaves. And that's it. It doesn't do anything unless, until you need it. Then you can, you can install a monitoring server somewhere. And the only thing it does, it pings the master. And if the master fails, then it launches scripts on the slave doing all this. It promotes one of the slaves to master. It, uh, uh, translate, it does a translation between binary log positions, so it makes sure that the uh, other slaves start replicating from the new master from the right position and all that stuff. So, so the, only, the only thing you actually, you don't have to add anything if you don't want to. You can just install the script and then when you need them, you run them. But it can also do it automatically with the number faster. So we have a lot of customers using this mainly because it's so easy to install because you don't have to do anything. You have a, you have a running replication hierarchy. You just don't you change, change nothing, you just add MHA, and then when you need to do a failover or a manual switchover, then it launches the scripts and that stuff. Uh, right. So it's a very useful tool, and it's open source. And that's my system. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Any questions about MHA? Has anyone used it? Giuseppe? I'm skipping 5.6 because you said already talk, talks about it. Uh, I'm going to skip where you need to 10.0. Uh, well, basically because it's alpha, but they add some cool features. Uh, uh, is the uh, global transaction ID already in the distribution? Because last time I saw it was only in a uh, separate build. Yeah, no, it's not. It's coming in the it's coming in the next version, so it, which Probably it's going to be here in a month, uh, approximately. So <coughs> at the moment, MariaDB has multi-source replication, so you can have one one uh, uh, slave can have multiple masters. I mean, it's in the alpha version of 10.0, so it's not a, not exactly production ready, but some, that exists already. However, they're working on their global transaction ID, and that's not in the same binary yet. And that's what's going to come in the in the next version, uh, which should be the beta version of 10.0. It's going to be the multi-source and the global transaction ID that works with this. But it's, yeah, it will be in the beta version that it's coming next. The original date was next week, but April is likely. End of April is the likely date. If you ask Monty, he will say next week. But and how will it be different from uh, 
thousand ways. Uh, <laughs> what, what did you say? In two thousand ways. Yeah, it's completely, it's completely, it's designed, designed in a completely different way. Uh, I mean, it's, as Giuseppe just kind of said, the five six stuff, they were not designed in a coherent way. This is designed in, I mean, in a coherent way. One of the one of the best, best MySQL developers is actually doing it. So one of the most objective people. He's a very good uh, architect, the, uh, the guy, and he designed this, so it should work really well. And I mean, and it's, from the beginning, this is designed to work with multi-source application as well. So it's designed with this in mind. So you can have one master, can have uh, one slave can have multiple masters, and all of this is taken into account with the global transaction ID design. So I mean, I could talk a few hours about the differences. So it's, if you're really interested, I recommend actually uh, uh, the, the developer is Christian Nielsen. He's got a blog where he's uh, he's kind of uh, uh, explained his design, how he how he how the implementation will work and stuff. So I I recommend to read his blog. But the main difference is that because you have the multi-source feature, it has to be, it will work in a completely different way. Uh, like the MySQL one uses the UUID of the server as the kind of the, uh, I don't know, the, the transaction origin, so it's it's attached to a server. In in the MariaDB it will be flexible, so you can attach it to a group of servers. So you can have, you, you have a transaction coming from from a machine, and you can say that another machine is in the same kind of hierarchy. So transactions coming from the two of both machines are considered coming from the same machine, kind of. So you design, you can have different, yeah, you can have like a hierarchy of machines that are considered the same machine in the global replication hierarchy. But that's flexible, so you can actually change that and you can say, oh, okay, these machines are the same, I can't remember what it's called. It's, it's extremely flexible architecture. If you have any questions about that, uh, I don't have time to answer. Right, but read his blog if you're interested in the design. Just get the uh, Then there's tungsten, which I'm not going to talk about because we're going to talk about tungsten after this. So it's a faster solution. Uh, but you said you said will tell you more about this. I'm just going to skip it. Uh, there's a product called Galera. Who has heard about Galera here? Uh, so it's it's Galera uh, uh, is a product that provides uh, synchronous kind of it's called virtual synchronous replication uh, because it's not exactly synchronous but it gives a synchronous replication between uh, uh, MySQL servers. It does not use use the binary log but instead uh, uh, the inner DB. Uh, commit, when, when you commit a transaction in a DB, it's actually, uh, the transaction instead of being committed locally, it's first verified by your, all, all your servers in your cluster. Uh, and all servers have to kind of uh, acknowledge this change and make sure and verify that it doesn't conflict with anything they have. And then it's applied in all the machines afterwards. So it's like synchronous application, but it's uh, uh, it's like synchronous, but it's, it's called virtual synchronous because uh, because you, the slaves or the, the other masters, they don't apply the change. They, very, they say, okay, this change is good, I can accept this. And then the commit goes through and then they apply it. So there's a small lag between the application of the change and, and the actual, uh, and the acknowledgement you get. So but it's a cool feature because it's synchronous. So if you get a commit, I mean, if your commit goes through, it means that this transaction exists on the other machine. So there is no uh, possibility of having lost transactions. If a transaction is validated, it exists on the other machine. So like with, with the async solutions, there's, there's always a chance that if a, cr a crash on the master happens just after the commit, it did not propagate anywhere. Here there is no such no risk. The transaction being validated will exist on the machines. Uh, 
same thing, you don't really have a problem with slave lag and so forth because, because it's applied inside InnoDB, so it has the same kind of concurrency as InnoDB has. Well, it has an internal, internal concurrency that you can change, but it's, it, you can pretty much have parallel applications. And it's not for a database like in MySQL, uh, like with the 5.6 implementation, the parallel, the parallel replication is for schema. Here it's not, it's per transaction pretty much. So you can have as many concurrent transactions as you want, independently of if they're the same scheme or not. Uh, in theory, you can have multi master replication with this. You can write to, se to several masters at the same time, uh, except that uh, normally on InnoDB, uh, when you, you can have multiple transactions, at the same time, probably at the same time, because there's a, something called row logs, right? So if you do an update on a row, uh, the transaction that you're doing the update in gets a lock on this row. So no other transaction can actually write to the same row. So if you have another transaction trying to write to the same row, it will wait until the lock is released by the first transaction, right? That's how a, a multi concurrency works in databases. Uh, here, of course, you don't take locks on the other machines as you're writing. So if you do an update on one machine, you don't take a lock until you do a commit. This means that you could potentially have another update on another machine touching the same row. So there could be a conflict, and it's not detected until you commit. So you might actually have, if you use this for multi-master, uh, you might get a lot of aborted transactions. So you kind of have to be aware of this when you design your application to use to use the So you can use the multi-master, but Make sure that you don't have conflicts, or or be prepared to deal with aborted transactions on the commit side. Right. So how does it work? Um, here's a small diagram. So basically, you are writing to one one server. Uh, when you do commit, the transaction is sent out to the other machine, other servers. The other servers are asked to validate the transaction, and validate that they don't have conflicts. If they have conflicts, then at this stage the transaction is aborted. You, the client gets back an answer saying the transaction aborted. If it goes through, then the client gets an OK, and the change set is, is stored in the other servers and then applied. And that's how it's up. And another problem with uh, another potential problem with Galera, so it's a third party solution, and it's of course they kind of change in the DB because it's in, in, the, in the DB the thing. So you cannot use standard MySQL with Galera. You have to use a MySQL uh, distribution where Galera is built in. So at the moment, there's three way, three sources for this. You can use, uh, well, you can go to Galera, Galera, Galera's website. They have a distribution, but you can also use uh, MariaDB Galera cluster or Percona XDB cluster. Both are built on. Has anyone heard of any of these? No? Oh, sorry. Right. So there's three sources. You can, if you want to try Galera, you can go to MariaDB Galera cluster, Percona XDB cluster, or Galera Excel. So then for high availability, you can also use this space, this space solutions. So anyone has anyone used that? So if you have a SAN or something like that, you can set up uh, you can you can set up set this up as your HA solution. The problem with, with doing this, and it works fine with InnoDB because InnoDB is crash safe. The main problem with using uh, any of this disk based solution is that it's an active passive solution, uh, which means that if your active server goes down, you have to wait until you have if, until your passive server comes up. So basically what you do is you, you have MySQL running on the server, you point it to the sun as the as the data, as the disk drive. If your server crashes, you have another server that's been pointing to the same disk drive, you start up the other server and it does a crash recovery on the disks and it starts up. So if you tune this really well, you can get down to around a minute as downtime. That's pretty much the fastest fast you can get for this resolution. One minute of downtime on your server. So it's not an ideal solution, but if you have a stand lying around, one that you use. 
uh, that there is something called DRBD. Has anyone used that? Which is basically a kind of a poor man's SAN. You don't have a SAN, but you want to have similar functionality. Well, DRBD is basically it's called the distributed replication block device. Basically, it's replicate it's uh, uh, replication of the disk. So you fill out the file, syst uh, file system layer and you replicate the disk blocks. So on the remote machine, you have you have a device that's basically uh, mirror mirrors the device you have on the other machine. So every time there's a change on the first machine, the MySQL server or whatever you have there thinks it's writing to local disk, but it's actually first the, the write is actually first sent to the other machine. So you write to both local disk and remote disk. <coughs> and Otherwise, the setup is the same as with using a SAN. You have one of these machines active, the other one is passive. The active machine dies, you start up the passive. So you have the same problem with, with downtime because you have to do a crash recovery with the passive machine. Any questions? And of course, the shared disk and the DRBD solutions can be combined with replication. So you have the master has a shared disk or DRBD, and then you have slaves, uh, slaves that are reading uh, from the master. And this, of course, means that if the master fails and you have to do your, your, your uh, crash recovery of the passive machine, your slaves are still available, so you can still read. Even though your system, you can't write for a minute, you can still read during this period, so you don't stop all of your traffic if you combine this with replication slaves. And because the and because the two masters use exactly the same disk configuration, you don't have a problem with bin log position and stuff like that because they will be exactly the same on both machines. So it will just replication will just work uh, when the passive machine comes up. And then the last thing is MySQL cluster. Has anyone heard of MySQL cluster? Has anyone used MySQL cluster? It's a so MySQL cluster is a product that's actually really badly named. Probably one of the worst names in history. Uh, so for number one thing, it's not a cluster of MySQL servers. It's something completely different. So a MySQL cluster is is is, is uh, it's a distributed network database. So it's a separate storage engine in MySQL that distributes your data for you. It's more like a, it's like a NoSQL database with a MySQL front end. Okay. 
So what Magic Classic does, so it has a lot of cool features, got asset, asset transaction, role level locking, and all that. But if you look down to down at what it does, uh, it basically separates the storage layer from, from the SQL layer. So you have your MySQL servers are in the second layer here, the SQL nodes. And then the storage layer is somewhere else. And it automatically distributes your data across these data nodes. So if you have a table, if you have four data nodes, every table will be partitioned into four pieces. And every node will be the master of one piece, one partition, and it will have a, slave, a secondary partition, which is a copy of another partition, right? So it, has, it partitions your data, and it also copies your data across these nodes, like this. So, but you use MySQL to, to access the data. But there are a few problems with this. Uh, it, it works really well if you do simple transactions, you do the primary key lookups and stuff like that. That's kind of what it was designed for. But if you start doing joints and stuff, uh, or more complex queries, you have problems because the data is distributed. You have to go to nodes to get to get different pieces of the data and so forth. So especially in the beginning, this was the kind of the query transformation from SQL queries to the local uh, data lookup methods was not very done very well. It was designed, done kind of the same way it was designed, designed, done, designed for MyISM my and InnoDB, which were local. It didn't take into account the fact that the data was distributed and the data was not local anymore. So a join that could last a few seconds with, with InnoDB could last an hour faster because you had to go and look up one row here take it back, look up one row there, and then you had each, each step you had, had a network hop. So you just add, add a huge amount of latency into the, into the query processing. It has been increased, I mean, it has been uh, improved quite a lot in the latest versions. So the latest versions, the joints, are no longer as bad, but they're still, if you use complex queries, cluster will never perform as well as, as, as the local. I mean, in the <coughs> However, on, on simple queries, cluster will perform better than having one, one instance of InnoDB. And why is that? Well, because you have this, you distribute the data storage across multiple machines, and when you use a primary key, one primary key lookup, you only access one of these machines. So you can do, if you have four data nodes, you can do four times the, the amount of queries you can do with one node. So you do gain speed, and because it's got uh, built-in replication, it also uh, has a security aspect on it. But it's a fairly complex product to use. I'm not going to go into this now, because it's very complex. Right, and here's a list of all of these solutions I talked about, a few of the important features, and whether they have it or not. So, the ASIC solutions are tungsten and replication, MySQL replication, and whether they're active, active, and so forth. And the only solution that does provide wide scalability is MySQL cluster because of the distribution of data, it actually scales bytes for you. The more nodes you have, uh, the more bytes you can do per time. Because each byte only has to go to two nodes. So it's the only solution that actually scales bytes. I made it in half an hour. Any questions about this stuff? It's all good. Hey Max, are you supposed to tell us these things because you said population? Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I don't know, yeah. No, no, I told you this, I'm going to have to kill you. Okay, right. I'm done, so you just have to. You want to continue? You want to do it now or you want to wait until 12? I can, I can start with time. I actually have to leave, I have a flight to catch. Alright, thank you.